It's the first day of summer in 2009, and Malcolm Turnbull's leadership of the Liberal Party is only surviving by the smallest of threads. In the eyes of many, Turnbull's unknowing use of fraudulent documents to call for Rudd's resignation had already made him unelectable. And now on top of that, he was supporting a huge Rudd policy, the emissions trading scheme. With some of the party on course to lose their jobs in 2010, 48 out of 82 Liberals voted for a leadership spill with three names to contest the ballot. Of course, Turnbull once again contested, as did his long-term rival Tony Abbott, but the favourite of the three was Joe Hockey. Against all belief, Hockey was eliminated in the first round, receiving just 23 votes compared to Turnbull's 26 and Abbott's 35. This put Turnbull and Abbott through to the second round, where it went down to the wire. Turnbull received 41 votes, while Abbott received 42. His mission? Take down the Rudd government at any cost. So we left the Gillard episode with Rudd's return to the top job just months before the 2013 election. And so this finally gave Abbott the job he'd initially prepared for back in 2010, before he had to change his focus to Gillard. Now, remember, Turnbull was taken down for being too conciliatory towards Rudd and therefore too impotent in opposition, meaning Abbott came into opposition with the mantle to be what my geography teacher called Noni Abbott. And so facing up against Rudd, Abbott was to be far from impotent. He played into people's fear of taxes by rallying against the carbon and mining tax, promised to stop the boats after Gillard had scrapped Rudd's reforms to return to Howard's offshore detention, and above all, promised to put the budget back in surplus after Labor repeatedly delivered budget deficits during the GFC. And so there's no need to put a dramatic twist on the 2013 election. It was as easy and routine a victory as they come for the Liberals, smashing Labor 90 to 55. That being said, according to polling data between June and September, it's estimated that Rudd's return to leadership saw Labor hang on to up to 15 of those 55 seats. And yes, this video is about Abbott, but I do want to take just a very brief moment to mention what happened to Labor after the defeat. So upon entering his second stint as Labor leader, Rudd introduced party bylaws that effectively made it impossible to knife a prime minister who had won an election, requiring three quarters of caucus to call for a leadership spill. On top of that, Rudd's reforms made the leadership ballot far more accessible to the public in a three-stage process. First, caucus, that's members from both houses of parliament, would nominate candidates for the ballot. Anyone who received over 20% of caucus's support would stand for leadership. So in 2013, that left Anthony Albanese and Bill Shorten as candidates. Secondly, grassroots party members would then get to vote for who they wanted as leader, and this made up about 50% of the final vote. So 60% of Labor members voted for Albo, while 40% voted for Shorten. Finally, the other 50% of weighting was given to Caucus, who voted 64% for Shorten and 36% for Albo. Put these two figures together, and hang in there, this is why I dropped extension maths, and Shorten emerged victorious 52% to 48%. For my mind, this is a pretty good system and much more transparent than, say, the US primary system. Hey, Mr. Mitchell, shut up. Now, let's be real. As Abbott emerged victorious, everyone knew that he was going to be no Howard. He entered Parliament as a culture warrior and, quite frankly, as a gaff machine. No one, however smart, however well educated, however experienced, is the suppository of all wisdom. Even John Oliver, who had earlier made a video praising Howard, made this satirical one about Tony Abbott. So it begs the question, why would the party of Turnbull and Christopher Pine have Abbott as their leader? Well, quite simply, he was by far the one best equipped to deliver an election victory and could be the one who undid all of Labor's reforms before they gave the leadership to a more palatable face. For those who think Abbott had a stronghold on the party, remember he only beat Turnbull by one vote after a majority had been called for a leadership spill, meaning a number of people who voted for the spill then went full control Z when they knew it was Abbott rather than Hockey who was contesting Turnbull. But for 2014, a staunchly conservative leader could pass through the liberal agenda at lightning pace and still allow enough time for a leadership change to redirect the public before an election in 2016. So in 2014, Abbott set to work repealing both of the key taxes that Gillard had put a name to. One, the carbon tax, and two, the mining tax, which was very watered down from Rudd's earlier proposal. 
The issue was that these weren't income taxes at all and didn't really impact the ordinary Australian. Abbott argued that these taxes reduced companies' ability to employ, which then had a wider impact on the economy, but it is worth noting that unemployment went up rather than down when these taxes were abolished. The other key effect of abolishing these taxes was lost revenue to the budget. Australia lost $6.5 billion in revenue with the mining tax and $7.6 billion with the carbon tax. Combine this lost revenue with huge promises of income and corporate tax cuts plus an $8.8 billion grant given to the Reserve Bank and going into the 2014 budget, the Liberals were going to be a long way from their promise to bring the budget back into surplus. In fact, by May, a month out from the budget, they went from Labor's $18.8 billion deficit in 2013 to looking like having a $48.5 billion deficit in 2014. Now, like I said in the Howard video, I think surpluses are a red herring when measuring economic performance. For me, a huge deficit is fine as long as it's investing in wealth generating infrastructure like Keating did with super. The issue was that the deficit was generated not by investment, but by slashing revenues because they were impacting their donors' as profits. Now, Abbott's treasurer, Joe Hockey, knew that there was no way he could announce a $48.5 billion deficit and urgently had to slash funding to bring the deficit down to something more palatable. The way that he did this was by slashing foreign aid to save $7.6 billion, welfare being made unavailable for those under 25, and those under 30 having welfare frozen for six months, pushing back the pension and cuts to schools and hospitals. On top of that, Hockey increased the fuel tax and sold $5.68 billion of government shares in Medibank, our biggest health insurer. In the end, this brought the deficit down to $29.8 billion, still over $10 billion more than what Labor had the year before. Unsurprisingly, this was not a good look for Abbott and his popularity was really starting to slump. Not only did he copy the austerity of Britain's Conservative Party, also video on that coming soon, subscribe so you don't miss it, but he also suggested bringing back knighthoods specifically for Prince Philip to very little public support. This was his reception at the 2014 NRL Grand Final. It's also worth adding that with the scrapping of the climate tax, Australia was ranked the second worst developed nation on climate action, only in front of Saudi Arabia. But still, I bet King Solomon doesn't get booed at Ronaldo's soccer game. Mr. Mitchell, talk about the Royal Commission into Unions. Yeah, I was getting there, mate. So yeah, as Ronaldo was alluding to there, Tony Abbott launched a $45.9 million Royal Commission into corruption within the unions. I'll spare you the details, but essentially 40 people were referred for charges with just one conviction. A CFMEU staff member was sentenced to a $500 good behavior bond after he disposed of documents that could have been requested by the commission. The documents were later found to actually be irrelevant to the commission. I will also add that one of Gillard's reforms that remained somewhat, and only somewhat intact, was the Gonski Funding Initiative. Check out the Gillard video for the details. Now, Abbott's Education Minister, Christopher Pine, announced that the government was reviewing Gonski for being, quote, a shambles and inferior to Howard's education models. That being said, Abbott kept Labor's funding commitments but did not require any contribution from the states like Gillard had requested for. The rationale behind this was that the funding could be kept because hockey had reduced university funding by 20%. But as Abbott was running a jackhammer through all of the recent Labor reforms, other Liberal MPs were using their portfolios to grow in power, one of which was Scott Morrison himself. Now, Abbott gave ScoMo his first ministerial position, and it was quite a coveted one, especially given that boat migration was deemed the second most important issue to voters, the Minister for Immigration. Immediately, Morrison launched Operation Sovereign Borders and campaigned on not allowing access to a single seafaring migrant, something which, to be fair, Rudd also campaigned on, with Manus Island to be used for offshore detention. Morrison had earlier criticised Gillard's Malaysia deal, saying that some migrants could be caned over there. I think it's safe to say that Manus Island proved to be much worse. In February of 2014, 70 protesters were injured in a demonstration, with an Iranian refugee being murdered with wood and a rock by two of the detention centre workers. Another Iranian asylum seeker died in the same year after the centre ignored advice and was slow to evacuate him for an infection due to a cut foot. But Morrison made this his ministry. As a quick side note, he visited my high school, I grew up in Cook, and I love react anyone who can guess which school, and when he was at my school, he boasted of stopping the boats to our school assembly. 
Sign up on Patreon for $1.50 if you want more stories about our run-ins with ScoMo. PY and Ben from the pod both have their own stories too. And I just realized I used refugees as a segue into plugging our Patreon. Perhaps a little distasteful. But speaking of distasteful, Morrison himself introduced the Migration and Maritime Power Amendment, which legalized the return of refugees to their home nation. Using those powers, Morrison then sent 37 Tamil asylum seekers back to Sri Lanka. Just for clarification, the Sri Lankan army had been accused of massacring and raping Tamil civilians in large droves during the end of the Sri Lankan Civil War. At the end of 2014, Morrison was moved out of the immigration ministry, but not after using Abbott's Stop the Boats campaign as a chance to accrue huge amounts of influence within the party. Now, given Abbott's constant current criticism of the Chinese Communist Party, and that was a lot of C's, you'd expect him to have been firmly anti-China during his time in office. But like with anything, it's important we don't put our current lens on past events. 2013 was the twilight of the commodities boom and the Chinese demand for our natural resources was what was keeping it alive. Remember, mining companies were huge donors of the Liberal Party. In 2013, they donated 2.847 million to the coalition, which was 81% of its campaign donations. Abbott had already done them two favors by scrapping the mining and carbon taxes, and so he wasn't about to antagonize China. So in 2014, Xi Jinping came out to Brisbane for the G20 summit before moving on to Sydney, Tasmania, and then Parliament House in Canberra. During his visit, Abbott invited him to speak in the house, and Abbott himself even said this about Xi. I have never heard a Chinese leader declare that his country would be fully democratic by 2050. Xi gave him some serious side eye, but the two nations then struck up a free trade deal. And given this channel's proclivity to defend China, you'd expect me to be rather happy about positive talks between Australia and China. And yes, it was absolutely so much better than what came next. However, there was one clause that China had over us. Essentially, businesses that were 50% or more owned by China and Australia could import Chinese labor, whereas Australia didn't have the same right in China. Abbott also struck up free trade deals with Korea and Japan, and when ISIL were filling the power vacuum that the US had left behind upon withdrawing from Iraq, Abbott pledged to support the US in airstrikes against them. He'd also earlier referred to the Syrian civil war as baddies versus baddies, and had called IS a death cult coming after us. Interestingly though, Abbott's communication minister Malcolm Turnbull gave a very different comment, saying that the government should not amplify their significance. And this very issue would prove to be pivotal going into 2015. For the Liberal Party, Abbott had been the perfect opposition leader and within a year had rammed through policies perfect for their donors, but he was in real danger of not winning in 2016. The Australian, again, not exactly known for their pro-Labor views, ruled that Abbott was the most unpopular Australian Prime Minister since Paul Keating in 1994. As a number of backbenchers were looking at losing their jobs in 2016, and as they were frustrated in being frozen out by Abbott, they started to loudly call for his head. One of whom was Andrew Lamming. Remember that guy? The party was also worried at how much power Abbott's chief of staff, Peter Credlin, had over the decision-making process. And so in February of 2015, a leadership spill was called with no challenger whatsoever. Only 39% called for the spill and so it didn't move through, but everyone knew that with numbers like that and no challenger, Abbott was a dead man walking. For many within the party, Turnbull had the polished appearance needed by a prime minister, and with the donors already satiated by Abbott's 2014 policies, it was now time for Turnbull to come in and deliver them the 2016 election. However, Turnbull needed to pick his moment to have due cause for the spill and had to bide his time. However, it was a fine balance. Abbott could always call for an early election against Labor, where the Libs would have no choice but to support him as leader. Rupert Murdoch himself had tweeted that Abbott was the best candidate in the coalition, and so many interpreted that as bait to press on with an early election to stave off Turnbull, even if it meant risking the Libs going back into opposition. And as far as the numbers were concerned, it looked likely that that would be the result. Like Abbott, Queensland LNP Premier Campbell Newman smashed Labor 78 seats to 7 in 2012, only to lose 44 seats to 42 one term later in 2015. Just to emphasize, they lost 36 seats in three years. And so despite dragging the Libs back from the wilderness, the party was well aware that like Newman, Abbott could take them back there. And so on September the 14th, 2015, news broke that Julie Bishop had informed Tony Abbott that Turnbull was moving against him. 
Another news story also broke that Tony Abbott had offered the deputy leadership to Scott Morrison, though Morrison declined because that would have involved ousting Joe Hockey for the Treasury, which he didn't want to do to his mate. Morrison still went on record though, saying that he was supporting Abbott in the spill. In the afternoon, Turnbull went to the press and confirmed that he was launching a leadership challenge on the basis of Abbott losing 30 consecutive news polls and self-appointed himself as someone who provided leadership that respected people's intelligence. Abbott then went to the press to announce that the leadership spill was indeed happening. That night, the party voted in favour of Turnbull 54 votes to 44. That dinosaur Abbott was out and now the new slick and progressive leader was in. The whole operation couldn't have gone better for the party, who were looking at an election less than a year away. Abbott went to the press, saying that there'd be no leaking or sniping on his part. A not so veiled dig at Kevin Rudd after he lost to Gillard in 2010. But what was most interesting to me was Turnbull's ministerial lineup going into the 2016 election. Julie Bishop retained her position as deputy leader of the party, while Scott Morrison, as in the same Scott Morrison who supported Abbott yet said no to being as treasurer, was announced as Turnbull's treasurer, the most prestigious ministerial position. It's almost as if there was a conversation that we don't know about. Don't you even think of clicking off just yet. Clearly, Abbott didn't have the hold on power that John Howard had over the party. But like Abbott, Howard had been knife before regaining leadership in the 90s. Find out how he made the most of his second chance right here.